Welcome back, everybody. Let's talk about calcium channels in this video. So we mentioned uh, in the overview video on neuromuscular transmission that these voltage-gated calcium channels are super important to the, um, the, the whole physiologic process of neuromuscular transmission. We said that as the motor neuron depolarizes, the calcium channels sense the voltage change of the membrane, open and allow calcium to flood in down its concentration gradient. The calcium then interacts with those vesicles that we talked about, uh, causing them to migrate towards the active zones and release their uh, quanta of, a, of acetylcholine into the neuromuscular junction. So calcium is super, super important. And um, we're going to mention a few things about these receptors in this video. So there's a couple of types of calcium channels in physiology. Um, the most important for neuromuscular transmission is these P-type calcium channels that I have written here. And the concentration of the calcium in the extracellular fluid is, is critical to the release of neurotransmitter into the junctional cleft. And it turns out that if you if you double the concentration of calcium in the extracellular fluid, you'll have a 16-fold increase in the amount of uh, acetylcholine released into the junctional cleft. So there's a very, very profound relationship between extracellular calcium concentration and the release of uh, transmitter into the junctional cleft. And these P-type calcium channels are how that, are how that takes place. So I thought to try and, like, uh, deepen your understanding and provide some context, I would give some just sort of clinical um, sort of applications of these calcium channels to try and help uh, memorize why, how important they are. And the first one I'll talk about is, um, is a paraneoplastic state uh, called uh, Eaton-Lambert myasthenic syndrome. And this is a paraneoplastic syndrome that's uh, it's not common by any means, but it's it's associated with small cell lung cancer, um, and it's an autoimmune disease, and and there's antibody that is produced, and that antibody attacks these calcium channels, specifically these P-type calcium channels, and then that leads to obviously impaired calcium entry into the nerve terminal, which gives you inadequate depolarization, and then they get muscle weakness. They often present with lower extremity, like proximal muscle weakness, fatigability, and that type of thing. And then as a result of the impaired depolarization, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on the other side of the neuromuscular junction, uh, on the motor side, will start to upregulate, and you'll get um, a fairly extreme uh, sensitivity to neuromuscular blocking agents that we use in anesthesia. So Eaton Lambert, that's a, a nice sort of anesthesia related uh, application of these calcium channels. Um, so if you're doing a thoracics anesthesia rotation and something to think about with, um, with small cell lung cancer and your use of neuromuscular blocking agents. Um, so another one we can talk about uh, is uh, hypermagnesemia. Um, so high concentrations of magnesium can actually block these P channels, these P type calcium channels, and prevent uh, calcium entry into the into the motor neuron sort of nerve terminal. And again, we, we know from what we understand now that if we have reduced calcium entry into the nerve terminal, then we get reduced acetylcholine release into the junctional cleft. So we get impaired depolarization. And this also presents with muscle weakness, like uh, uh, magnesium toxicity, one of the symptoms of that is muscle weakness. And from a similar mechanism that is described, you'll also get potentiation of, uh, of neuromuscular blocking agents. So, I mean, hypermagnesemia is not the most common of, of electrolyte disturbances by any means, but it is kind of relevant to us in anesthesia in that, uh, at least in obstetric anesthesia practice, we use magnesium sulfate as a um, as sort of a prophylactic agent in patients with uh, preeclampsia to try and prevent seizures. So if your patient's on a magnesium sulfate infusion, then good chance they can have high concentrations of extracellular magnesium, um, which may impair their uh, calcium channels here. So something to think about, one of the considerations if you have someone on, on, on magnesium therapy um, would be the effect of that on on these calcium channels and the subsequent impact that's going to have on your on your neuromuscular blocking agents and the dosing of those. Um, so finally, the last thing I'll talk about, if if you're like me and when I first started thinking and learning about these receptors, I was like, okay, well, 
We have all sorts of patients who are taking like calcium channel blockers or these cardiac patients. So why don't they have weakness and, and potentiation of muscle relaxants and that type of thing? Um, so what's the impact of calcium channel blockers on these calcium channels? It would be intuitive to think that they, they would cause problems, right? So, and this is where the different subtypes of calcium channels comes in. So verapamil, dotiazem, nafedipine, all these other calcium channel blockers, they interact mostly with the L-type calcium channels. And those are the ones seen in the cardiovascular vascular system. And they don't really have much of an impact at all on P channels, the P type calcium channels that we're talking about here. So if you were thinking that like I was, good question, good thing to think about, but it turns out that they don't really have much of an impact on these P type channels, which is great. Otherwise, all those patients would have muscle weakness and potentiation of neuromuscular blockers. So those are the calcium channels, really, really important to neuromuscular physiology. A couple of little applications that you can think about and considerations for anesthesia life, and um, hopefully that's helpful.